Okay, so today we're going to be focused on the ideal gas law and on the gas properties, pressure, temperature, and volume, and the amount of substance. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to go through the different um, pieces of the gas law, and then we're going to talk about the ideal gas equation, and then we will figure out how to manipulate that equation algebraically, and then we'll do what's called the combined gas law, where you look at multiple changes, like how, how will the pressure change if you double the volume and cut the temperature in half? And, and so you'd look at, at changes that way. We'll do a problem related to our car tires, like if, my, if a cold front comes in, your, your pressure will go down, but how much will it likely go down? And so we'll calculate that with a temperature change. And then uh, we'll get into Dalton's law of partial pressures next time. Today's really just kind of get you warmed up again with converting units and then working with a little bit of algebra on the ideal gas law. There are a lot of other concepts related to gases, but those are in the text. If you're reading those sections too, uh, then you'll catch the other pieces. Uh, and so we'll, I'll, I'll introduce some of the things that are in the textbook uh, as we talk through these slides. So volume, I mean, if, if you've got a substance, right, a gas, whether it's helium or hydrogen or, or oxygen, you know, that is that is matter, right? It has mass and it takes up space. And so if it if you have more substance, more moles of a substance, it's going to take up more space. In fact, it's directly proportional. And so we're going to be talking about these proportionalities. So that's what this little symbol means here. This is proportional to. So that's what that means. So you could say that V is equal to some constant times the number of moles. Uh, this, this would be a, a constant as long as you were at constant pressure. And so that would be isobaric conditions. So these are some vocabulary words for you. Isobaric, and then also it would be constant. This constant would be a constant if you were um, at constant temperature, so that's isothermal. So that iso piece means same, same baric, or bar is a unit of pressure, and so that's why they call it isobaric, and then isothermal is obvious because thermal is related to temperature. And it makes sense. I mean, more stuff equals more volume. You blow up a balloon, it gets bigger. Uh, volume is also proportional to temperature. If you're under isobaric conditions, and then there's a new one here, isopleth, so same amount of gas. So you've heard the term plethora when they say, oh, I have a plethora of cats, because I, yeah, you've got, a, it's a, an amount of something. And so this is a constant amount. Iso means constant, and then pleth is short for amount. Now this would be, I think, a, a, a fun experiment if you had a balloon, let's say at ice, ice water or standard temperature and pressure, so up here around, say, 273, let's go right there. Um, ice water, which is zero degrees C. <clears throat> so this is zero C. And then you put it in, say, uh, dry ice temperature, which is, you know, say down here. I don't remember the temperature of dry ice. Um, we'll just say it's, it's down here at um, um, 110 or something. And, and you stuck this balloon in, in ice water and you measured how much the water rose, you made a mark, you pulled it out, you made a mark, and then you've refilled it to see how much water was there. You've measured the volume of that balloon at one atmosphere of pressure. And then you have to probably get a different liquid because the water would freeze. So you would get a different liquid, put some dry ice in there, make a really, really cold bath, put that same balloon in that really cold bath, it's gonna shrink even smaller. Okay, you measure the volume. So now you've got the volumes as a function of temperature. And then if you extrapolate that down, so this was zero degrees C, minus 110, if you extrapolate it down, you get this part where the volume goes to zero. So volume goes to zero as the temperature went to minus 273 Kelvin. 
or, or minus 273 Celsius, sorry, degrees Celsius. You pick a different gas, pick a different initial volume, do the same experiment. They all have the same intercept. They all hit, the volume goes to zero at negative 273 Celsius. And so they thought, well, maybe there's something related to this. There's maybe our temperature scale is wrong. In fact, do you know where that Celsius scale came from? It's totally based on water. So it's zero where water freezes and it's 100 where, where water boils. And so that's a great temperature scale. We're in a water environment. And so why not use Celsius? But this is what they call thermodynamic temperature. They're saying, let's move our zero from water's melt, melting and freezing point down to absolute zero. And so that's where the Kelvin scale came from. So that's thermodynamic temperature. And anytime you do gas calculations, you need to do those calculations in Kelvin because that's the real temperature scale. The Celsius is just based on water. Okay, Fahrenheit, I have no idea. <laughs> no idea where that, what that's based on. Okay, it'd be a good, good thing to look up on Wikipedia or Google or something. Okay. Same thing happens with pressure. So as you take the temperature to zero, that pressure drops to zero. So this would be in a fixed container. You had a pressure gauge on there. You put it in ice water, put it in some really cold bath. You'd see the pressure drop. And then you extrapolate where the pressure goes to zero. If you were measuring temperatures in Celsius, it would go to make negative 273 would be where that pressure goes to zero. Now, this question here, discussion question, why are there no data points here in this dashed region? So like if we're measuring with a gas, I don't know, say we're measuring methane gas or something, and we get down to here and then, then there's this dashed region. It's probably because the gas turned to a liquid or froze, right? And so this is the gas law. This is dealing with gases. It's not giving us the full phase diagram of liquids and solids. It's just how the gases behave. So these are all gas laws. Here's another vocabulary word too, constant volume. So this is the pressure at constant volume. And so that's an isochore, C-H-O-R-E. And then we have Boyle's law. <clears throat> this is what we call it inversely proportional. So pressure is inversely proportional to volume. So that means it go, it's proportional to one over volume. It's the inverse of volume. And again, that's the case if it's in isothermal conditions or in an isopleth. And so this would be an example of Boyle's law. Notice as the pressure drops, you follow along this curve, the volume gets larger. And so if you're going this direction, That would be an isothermal expansion. And that's what drives our vehicles. This is a piston. So we put the gas in there, reacts with oxygen, burns, high temperature, okay, and then it's a high pressure. And so that, that piston, that's a, that's a movable wall in that container. And it happens to be turning the crank that turns our wheels. And so it'll push that piston down and that's an expansion. Whether it's isothermal or adiabatic, we'll get to in PCHEM 2. Okay, so give it a few more years. But it's, a, it's pushing that piston. And if it goes along at a constant temperature, that's an isothermal expansion. That pressure drops down to a more reasonable pressure and the volume has increased. And by increasing that volume, we've turned the crank and delivered torque in a rotating system that can turn our wheels. So we have, in my truck, we have eight cylinders. So there's eight of those going all the time, turning the crank in the same direction and providing torque to turn the wheels. Now this is a huge safety issue for scuba divers. So put in your mind scuba diver. Anybody have any experience with scuba diving? No, but I've had patients that have like PE because of this. What's that? Yes, exactly, and that's the, that's the actual risk. So how would you get a pulmonary embolism? If you're down, say, even 12 feet of water, you're in a swimming pool, you take a breath on your regulator, it put that volume into your lungs at a certain pressure. And then when you rise, the pressure drops and the volume wants to expand. And so if you're ever scuba diving, you always blow out when you're rising. 
to let that excess gas come out of your lungs because your lungs, they can expand a little bit, but eventually they can bust. You get an embolism, which is the air sacs will break and then they can bleed into your lungs. So that's not good. So even uh, when I was taking this to scuba diving class, oh, that was fun in summer. Maybe you have an option of doing that. I would go back home in the summer between my uh, freshman and sophomore year and take um, like one of my core courses at the junior college and then always take a fun class. And I, scuba diving was one of the classes. And so in the scuba diving course, we would always be down in the swimming pool, 12 feet of water and testing things. You have to take off your mask and flood it and you have to take off your buoyancy compensator and put it back on. All these different tests that you have to do underwater. And uh, and while you're doing that, you're paired up buddy system. The the instructor would come along behind you and, and turn off your tank. And so you're going along and all of a sudden you're sucking on a dry uh, regulator and you got to know what that feels like. So that's part of the lesson. And you, you get your buddy's attention. You point at your tank and they test the valve and turn it on. And they have you have a buddy breather. You have an extra mouthpiece. And so they can give you a buddy breather. And so anyway, scuba diving is a lot of fun. I don't think we teach it here, but if you have a chance to to uh, do a scuba diving class, I highly recommend it. <clears throat> so the ideal gas law combines all of these properties. Okay, so if we have this uh, Boyle's law, where pressure is is proportional to one over volume, <clears throat> it's that one over volume times a constant. If you multiply both sides by uh, by the volume and multiply the constant by temperature, we end up with this. So we multiply both sides by volume. Let's just do that. Okay, so these volumes cancel. And so that above equation satisfies both Charles' law and Boyle's law and Edmonton's law, okay, which is multiplying both the right side by, by N to satisfy Avogadro's law. And so we end up with this piece here, that the little K is a constant. Now that K, um, it's kind of nice to use K because Boltzmann's constant is K. Let me show of hands, has anybody heard of Boltzmann's constant? Okay, one, anybody else? Heard of it? Okay. Two. It's an interesting constant. If you look at it, it's an energy per Kelvin. This is an interesting conversion factor, right? You can convert temperature to energy and energy to temperature. So it's a fantastic constant. What if we didn't want just joules, but we wanted joules per mole, right? I mean, a joule is a really small amount of energy. Um, you know, one degree change in, in Kelvin you know, it's 10 to the minus 23 uh, joules for just, just like a single particle. What if we had a mole of particles? We can multiply that that uh, Boltzmann's constant by Avogadro's number, which is huge, 6 times 10 to the 23rd per mole, and we end up with a very familiar gas constant. So R, our gas constant, really is just Boltzmann's constant per mole. Now, the units of joules are not that useful for gases because we're dealing with pressure, temperature, and volume. And so we can convert that over to liters and atmospheres per mole Kelvin, and this is the familiar gas constant. So this is the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, and then this is that gas constant. I really want you to memorize that gas constant, okay? It's something that, that you should have in your head, 0 0.0821 or 08206. Uh, either one, um, liters, atmospheres per mole Kelvin. You've got to use the units. This uh, gas law, if you have the wrong units in it, you're going to get garbage results if you're using the wrong temperature. So you've got to use Kelvin. This tells you you've got to use Kelvin. If you've got uh, pressures in, say, millimeters of mercury, you've got to convert those over to atmospheres if you're going to use this constant. You can write this constant in millimeters of mercury, and it'll be a different number. But, but why not just convert the units so it's compatible with the constant that you know? Okay. Yes? Are we going to have like a formula sheet on exams? Absolutely. So this constant will be on the periodic table. So on the periodic table, you know, it's kind of, look how it's shaped. Where it says periodic table of the elements up there on that one, there's going to be lots of little constants and conversions. So you'll get one of those for the test. And you'll have an equation sheet on the back. So let's, let's do some algebra. 
This is um, using the ideal gas law. Let's solve for pressure. So if we divide both sides by V to get pressure on the left, then we end up with pressure is equal to N RT over V. Believe it or not, we've had students that try to memorize all of these instead of just memorizing PV equals NRT, okay? And doing one step of algebra, okay? So, you know, when you, when you were in math class and you say, I'll never see this again, you were wrong. <laughs> Use your math skills and do your algebra and, and get comfortable with it, okay? Let's solve for volume, same thing. Different uh, variables, so we saw, divide by P. So volume is equal to N. RT over P. And why would you want to do this? Well, that would be if you had this situation, you were asked for the volume and you knew the pressure, you knew the number of moles, you knew the temperature and you knew the gas constant. So you want to solve for pressure. So you put all the things that you know on the right and solve for volume. Okay. All right, what about number of moles? Well, in this case, to isolate the number of moles, we're going to have to divide both sides by RT. Okay. And this is where um, I'm going to write the gas constant down here, 0 0.0821 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And of course, it's going to be times the temperature in Kelvin. And it's going to have a, an atmosphere on top from the pressure. And it's going to have a liter on top for the volume. So notice how the units cancel, liters cancels. The liters, atmospheres cancels, atmospheres. Kelvin in the denominator cancels this one in the denominator of the denominator. And then it's one over, one over moles. So that comes up on top. Okay, so ends up, this mole ends up on top because it's one over, one over moles. So just a review of that. So when you have the units here, you can see, you know you got it right because you know that moles is on top now and you've got the correct, um, the correct units. Last one, we'll solve for temperature. So temperature is PV over NR. And once again, that's going to be the same kind of thing. Everything's going to cancel except this Kelvin down here. And it'll be 1 over 1 over Kelvin. And so then the Kelvin comes to the top and your units, your, your number is going to be in Kelvin. That's all. I mean, there's only four variables in this thing. And we've solved for all four of them. So it's not that bad. And surely you can remember PV equals NRT. So if you've got that, you can do the algebra on the other pieces. I mean, you can do anything to an equation as long as you do it to both sides of the equal sign. Okay. So let's look at, what's that? <laughs> I feel like it's a lot of words. Oh, okay, words. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, so uh, so this is a problem. Let's do an example problem with the, with the ideal gas law and, the, and what we call the combined gas law. Uh, this is the situation when you don't know all the variables right here. This is, this is the key. So sometimes you want to know, like in our case, the change in pressure with the change in temperature. And I'm talking about my tires, okay, on my truck. <clears throat> so uh, I had 50 PSI in them when the temperature was 77F out here at the, you know, in Huntsville. And I went ahead and converted it to Celsius and Kelvin for you. And a cold front came through and cooled my, cooled everything down, including my tires, to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 10C and 283 Kelvin. So in the morning, my check tires came, light came on. Well, I know it got colder. Um, and my manual says that when the pressure goes below 25 PSI, that light's going to come on. So was it the cold front or do I have a leak in my tire? So this is a practical example of when you would use the, the, um, the combined gas law. Now, what are the things I don't know? 
I don't know moles, or I have no idea how many moles of gas are in my tire. Okay. And I also don't know the other one, volume. I mean, I might be able to make an estimate of it, but I, I don't know volume. But I can measure the pressure and I can measure the temperature. And so I know pressure and temperature. So notice what I've done here. I've got, um, I've got the ideal gas law written with ones and twos. And this is a nice trick with any equation. It can be a really confusing equation, but you can sort of set it up as situation one divided by situation two. And then the things that I don't know, if they haven't changed, they'll cancel. So I don't know the number of moles, but I'm gonna assume at first that I did not have a leak. And so they're gonna say, well, let's, let's pretend that that the number of moles has not changed. And, and so they'll cancel. The ideal gas constant is a constant. So it's gonna be the same. And the volume of my tire, uh, because it's flexible, it hasn't changed. Okay, it's, it's the pressure that changes with temperature. We're, we've got a pretty, pretty strong tire material. And so uh, the tire will, will look flat, but it's still kind of got the same volume. It's just in a different shape. Okay, so we'll assume that the volume hasn't changed. And so now I have a relationship with pressure at, at situation one, the pressure at situation two, and temperature at situation one, and temperature at situation two. Notice I've got my two temperatures. So this would be temperature one here. And this is temperature two. My original 50 PSI is pressure one. And then I have the question mark on pressure two. So I'm gonna solve for the new pressure at the new temperature and see if that's below 25 uh, PSI. If it's above 25 PSI, then it wasn't the temperature that made my tire go below 25 PSI. That means I have a leak. Okay. Just a coincidence that that leak happened when a cold front came through. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that math. So doing a little bit of algebra, we're going to um, <clears throat> multiply P2 times both sides and then multiply, let me just do it over here. So I'll say P2 over here and over here. So my P2s cancel on this side. My N1 and R's have canceled. And I'm gonna multiply this by T2 over T1. And over here, T2, oops. Okay, <clears throat> and my volumes have canceled. And so my uh, T2s on this side have canceled and the T1s have canceled. And so now I've got P2 by itself is equal to P1 times T2 over T1. Okay, and hopefully, you know, you can get more comfortable with that. If I've got P2 on the bottom here, I can move it over here to the top. Now I've got T1 on top, it goes over to the bottom on the other side. T2 on bottom, it goes over to the top on the other side, and you end up with this equation. So we have 50 PSI times 283 Kelvin over 298. I saw someone get a calculator out. Did you did you do it yet? Uh, 47.48. Okay. 47. That's good enough. PSI. So notice that's that I mean that wasn't a great cold front. You know, it's kind of like the first one we get in October. It's not too much. I'll take it, but it only dropped in absolute temperature from 98 298 to 283. So it only changed the pressure a little bit. It only would have changed my pressure by three PSI in, in that big a drop, okay? And so this tells me I have a leak, right? My light would not have come on if it only dropped to 47 PSI. And so now I know I have a leak, I better go check that out. 
Any questions about this, these steps that we did? We did the algebra with the combined gas law. We multiplied some things on both sides to, to get pressure two on one side and have everything that we knew on the other side. Okay, let me introduce this idea. This is called a state variables table. This is a great tool for collecting all of the things that you know and the things that change and don't change and so on. Same kind of problem. We're doing it in atmospheres here just for grins. But the, we have the steps or conditions like condition one, initial, condition two, final. We have an unknown number of moles, but we assume that they're unchanged. And so that allows us to cancel the moles. So it's the same problem. I'm just showing you a kind of a different way to, to, to approach it. Um, we have an unknown volume, but we assume that it's not changed. And so the volumes have canceled. And then the gas constant cancels as well. So we have the same relationship. Um, this was the conversion. So it's in the video now. If you didn't see how I converted those temperatures, I went from 77 F. Uh, since Fahrenheit has that offset of 32 degrees F for the, for the um, water freezing point, you subtract that 32 from 77. And then to get to Celsius, there's a there's nine degrees of Fahrenheit for every five degrees of Celsius. And so you you multiply by five ninths and that converts your Fahrenheit to Celsius. And then to get to absolute temperature, you add 273 Kelvin. And we'll see those equations at closer to the end of this uh, lecture. Do the same thing with 50 and we get the 283 Kelvin. So that's how I got my Kelvin temperatures. If we were going to work this problem in atmospheres, I would take the 50 PSI and divide by 14.7 PSI for every atmosphere. So that would convert over to 3.41 atmospheres. So let's redo the problem just to see what our pressure would be in atmospheres. So P2 would be 3.41 atmospheres times 283 Kelvin over 298 Kelvin. Can you do that one again for me? Yeah. Is it going to be what? 3.3? 3.2? If you multiply that one by 14.7, just for grins. 14.7? Yeah. Yeah, so that's the 47 PSI that we had on the previous page. So that's nice, it all works out. But anyway, I just wanted to show you another way to do this. And this will be an important thing if you continue on to PCHEM2 or thermodynamics, the state variables table, especially when we have a situation where you've got multiple points, like in, a, in an engine cycle where you've got the intake and the expansion and then the exhaust and so on. As we're going through the thermodynamic properties, we have lots of different situations. And so it's good to sort of keep track of your temperatures, pressures, and volumes at each point in the process. So the more organized you can be about how you pro approach a problem, the better you're able to think. And so this is more of a thinking tool than anything else. Yes? Yeah, you could round it to 48. And I and on the numerical problems on Blackboard, I put a 5% uh, flex in there. So if you put in 48 or 47, that would be okay. Yeah. How yeah. stiff are you on sig figs? Um, we're really not that strict because of that 5% um, you know, cushion, I guess. And so I'm, I'm more, you know, you get within 5%, you, you, you did the problem right. Yeah. And uh, is that the same on test? Yes. So if you'll notice the, the, the numbers up here, the masses, like sodium, for goodness sakes, 22.989707. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. You know, that's eight sig figs. But that, why type all that in on a test when your time is, is going? So if you look at my periodic table, everything only has three digits. Yeah. 
<laughs> so you know it's you, you you don't have time to type in eight digits and you're probably going to screw something up the more numbers buttons you punch right and so you know 14 is nitrogen and oxygen 16 good enough hydrogen's one you know and so when we get into stoichiometry and we're doing molar masses and you have methane and it's ch4 carbon's 12 and you have four hydrogens 12 13 14 15 16 i'm done i know the molar mass right it's 16. Yeah, there's some decimal places, but I'll know if you got it, if you did it right, if you use 16 for methane and, and uh, O2 is 16 a piece, that's 32, you know, so you should be able to just do those kinds of problems that way. And, and I'm happy with it. So here's a nice little cheat sheet that you guys can cut out and stick in your wallet. So if you ever need, you know, to know <laughs> how to convert from Pascal's to PSI, you could you can get it done. Okay. And so I don't expect you to do that, but you never know. Um, and so here, these are the temperature conversions. And these are the strangest ones that you'll deal with because there's that offset of 32. Kind of, it's kind of crazy. So if you have te temperature in Celsius here, um, you've got this conversion factor because they're not the same gap in temperature, okay? And then you have this, this intercept. So it's like Y equals MX plus B, right? This is the slope, this is X, and this is the intercept. And so it's a linear equation in temperature. Um, and, you know, it's, it's this business that that's very similar to Y equals MX plus B, okay? Um, get used to using these, um, conversion factors, following the units. Um, let me just ask you something. I was covering this years ago in this class and uh, this person was using like Ohm's law, okay? Don't, you don't have to write all this down, okay, Ohm's law. And that is a V equals IR, okay? And so this student had, let's see, I got it's such it's so foreign to me. I gotta remember how they did it. Okay, they drew a circle. Oh yeah, ladybug. And oh then you my god. Put it in half at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, oh man, I hate this so bad. <laughs> okay, so this student had been taught to do the ladybug. Okay, uh, they came up to me and said, with the temperature conversions, what goes in the circle? And I had never heard of the ladybug or the circle or anything, right? This only works with this kind of equation here. That's the only kind of equation it works with. It doesn't work with an intercept. So I didn't know what the circle was. I, I you know, and they said, well, like Ohm's law, and they drew it, and they said V equals I R, and now this business. And I said, I'm so sorry. And they said, what? And I said, your teacher didn't teach you algebra. <laughs> You know, and that was it, it really. Oh, yeah, it's a neat trick. But it, then later on, you've got this shortcut that doesn't work. So just, you know, use your algebra. You know, we've got an intercept, we've got a slope and so on. Now, the slope is kind of easy to remember. If you can't if you can't remember nine fifths. OK, that actually comes from water. Right. So what is the um, what is the boiling point of water in Fahrenheit? Yeah, 212. And what is the um, freezing point of water? 32. Okay. What is the boiling point of water in Celsius? This is degrees F. Uh, 100 and 0 C. Okay. So this up here is 180. Yeah, 180. And this is 100. And that equals 9 fifths, right? So that's where the nine fifths came from. So if you can't remember if it's five ninths or nine fifths, you could go back to your boiling points of water and you could figure it out. Okay. Um, but anyway, that's where the nine fifths came from. Yeah. And then the, this right here, this is the slope for Kelvin and Celsius. And they said, look, let's not make things complicated. We've just shifted the zero from being zero C and minus 273 C to move the zero down to 273. Let's keep the same increment. Okay, so uh, the terms of the number of degrees between boiling and freezing water is the same increment. There's 100 Kelvin between that and 100 Celsius between that. So they have the same slope 
It's just uh, one to one. And so that that's where, you know, when you say, how can I add Kelvin to Celsius? Because this is in Celsius and that's in Kelvin. Is that legal? Well, technically, you're multiplying by the slope of one Kelvin for one degree C. And that converts this degree C, those cancel. And now you have your temperature in Kelvin, but you got to add on the intercept of 273. And so it is a legit unit conversion, but you're probably just ignoring the whole multiply by one thing. Okay. Now, inverting those is a little tricky. You've got to subtract B from Y. And so that's this piece. And then you got to divide by M. And so that's this piece upside down, right? And so it's just the inverse of those. And so these are some great equations. I will have those four equations on the back of the periodic table in case you need them. Okay. Um, and then all of these pressure conversions, there are a lot of different pressure units. Uh, we've talked about PSI and atmospheres and used that 14.7 PSI for atmospheres. There's a couple of strange ones, just millimeters of mercury. <clears throat> So if you have um, a pool of mercury, it was really kind of fun back in the day when we had mercury everywhere. So you had uh, you have this inverted tube, and it has a merc has mercury in here, and a vacuum. How do you pull a vacuum on a tube that doesn't have any openings? Well, you fill this thing with mercury, so there's no air in it, and then you in the old days, put your finger over the top, stuck it underneath the level of mercury and pulled your finger out. And then it would fall down and it would measure the atmospheric pressure. So the atmosphere is pushing down on this pool of mercury here, air from the atmosphere. And that's keeping the mercury from flowing out. If there was a vacuum, outside, then the mercury would just flow out because there's a vacuum inside, a vacuum outside, the mercury would all flow down. Gravity would pull it down. So gravity's pulling it down, uh, and so there's a vacuum there, and the air pressure is pushing it back up into the tube. Okay, And so then this height of mercury right here for one atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury because okay. it's so dense. So there's a, in that tiny volume, it weighs a lot. And so that's a nice, reasonable, you know, 760 millimeters in terms of a, you know, a experimental apparatus in the lab, 760 is right there. So that would be, you know, one atmosphere of pressure. So the mercury column just needs to be taller than that. So you have a, you know, an 85 or 90 centimeter um, uh, glass column, you fill it with mercury, and you've got a barometer. You can measure the atmospheric pressure. But it seems strange that pressure is measured in linear units, right? Millimeters of mercury. How does that work? Well, it's just how, how tall the mercury column is, and that's a unit of pressure. Yeah, so, so I don't know if you ever really thought about that. It's like, how is pressure a, a linear dimension? Yeah, but it's just because of the apparatus that you use to measure it. And this is the conversion. One atmosphere is 760. Uh, millimeters of mercury. Uh, Torricelli was a scientist in the past, and so this unit of millimeters of mercury was also named Tor after Torricelli. So that's the same unit. A Tor is a millimeter of mercury and vice versa. Now, water's not nearly as dense as mercury, so how long would a column of water be? Yeah, 36 feet or so. So a perfect vacuum up above that water and atmospheric pressure one atmosphere could hold a column of 36 feet of, of, uh, of water. That, that means a, a, a th perfect vacuum can't pull it above that. It can't pull it to 37 or 38. And so that's a nice little trivia thing. Is if I bet you, I don't know, a billion dollars to stand on the top of this roof and try to suck water through a straw that was 38 feet long, I'd be pretty comfortable. You were not going to be able to do it. I don't care how, how, you know, capable you are, okay? Because the only thing that's making the water go up that straw is the atmospheric pressure. You're pushing out with your lungs, and the atmosphere is trying to fill that volume. You've expanded the volume, and the pressure, atmosphere pushes it in the air into your nose and mouth. And so you're working against one atmosphere of pressure, 
and there's no way you'll be able to suck water through a 38 foot straw. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I bet you a billion dollars. A it's a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> we got to go find a straw. Now. Okay. And then volume conversion. Well, let's talk about some of the other pressure units. This SI unit of pressure is a Pascal. And so this is showing you the actual like physics behind pressure. It's a Newton. Okay. Per square meter. And so you have a Newton of force coming down on a square meter of area. And so if you have a, a smaller area and the same force, you got a higher pressure. And there's some fun little calculations in the OpenStax book. They have an elephant foot and, a, and then they have a figure skater. And the figure skater, all of her weight is on a little blade of steel. And the big old elephant's foot is like an eight centimeter square or something like that. And the figure skater puts more pressure down because it's a, that's the area effect. And so that's a fun calculation in, in the open stacks book. So then uh, if you have one kilogram, you know, accelerated with gravity and that gives you one Newton of force and then put that on a square meter and so on and compare that to atmospheres. One atmosphere is 101,325 pascals. So it's a tiny little force. A Newton force is really tiny. Okay. So that's, that's the definition to get you to SI units. And then here, one atmosphere and one bar. I do not understand why we need bar. I mean, it seems like atmosphere was good enough, but then they added in bar. And a, a bar, let's see, I don't have it on here. One bar is equal to 100,000 pascals. <clears throat> they were just really irritated by that 101,325, I guess, and they just made it 100,000 and called it a bar, okay? But you hear about the pressure units of bar every time you're on, uh, see the weather report, you see those, those uh, contour lines when they show the pressures, and those are called isobars. And so those contour lines are pressure isobars. Okay. And then the volume, you know, you've got cubic inches here, 61 cubic inches per liter. Um, a meter cubed is 1,000 liters. 1,000 centimeters cubed is a liter. Um, I went ahead and wrote this one this way. Instead of saying a liter is 1,000 milliliters, I wanted to write it this way to, to reinforce the metric system because milli, by definition, is 10 to the minus 3. Okay. So let's practice some temperature conversions. So does anybody know what sort of the scientific definition of room temperature is? Yeah, so if we say room temperature, if I tell you something's at room temperature, it's 25, 25, yeah, very close. Room temp is equal to 25 degrees C. It's very easy in Kelvin, you just add 273, but I'm gonna go ahead and show the algebra on that one. So in Kelvin, that's 25 degrees C times one degree C per one Kelvin plus 273 Kelvin. And that ends up being 298. Very close to 300 Kelvin. Okay, what about Fahrenheit? Uh, let's see. Yeah, let's see. I never can remember, so I always have to do this calculation a lot. So we have 25. Whoops. You see that? I said 25 and wrote 55. Mm. 25 degrees C. Okay. I'm not looking at the equations and trying to remember it. There's, there's, there's more degrees F and a degree C, so that means the nine goes on top and the five goes on bottom, okay? Okay, so 25 divided by five is five, and five times nine is 45, so 77. 
So that's the room temperature. What's that? Yeah, that's right. That's, uh, that may be room temperature, but that's not my sleeping temperature. I really crank it down and uh, hibernate. Okay. <laughs> yes. And so uh, just got a few more minutes. Let's do one. I don't know. Yeah, let's do Fahrenheit. Let's say like if it's 100 degrees out, you know, it's been 100 all summer, it seems. So let's do 100 Fahrenheit. And let's get that to Celsius and Kelvin. You know, it's it's interesting. You talk to friends in Europe and they always use C and I have no idea. The way they, yeah. like when I lived in London, they said just cut it in half and add, cut it in half and add 30. Yeah, okay. For Fahrenheit. So we'll, we'll, we'll test it out. We'll see if that works. Okay. 100 cut it in half, 50 plus 30 is like 80. So you got to subtract that intercept first, subtract the 32, and then you got the 9 on bottom this time. You have 5 degrees C. Okay. So that's so going to be 68. Double it and add 30. Oh, okay. Celsius to Fahrenheit. So, yeah, I gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay. So what do we have here? Somebody do that for me? Sixty-eight point five. I'll just go with sixty-eight. Okay. So sixty-eight. So that's man. That sounds. That sounds really comfortable. <laughs> that doesn't sound. It sounds really high in terms yeah, of Celsius. That, that's, yeah. That's, that's like high. boiling. Yeah. Let's try that again. Thirty-seven. There we go. Thirty-seven. Yeah, that's right. Thirty-seven. Yeah, and body temperature is real close to thirty-seven. Okay, that's good. Yeah, thirty-seven Celsius. And then if you add 273 to that, we get to Kelvin. Okay, zero carry the one, zero carry the one, 300. Well, half and 30 actually works. If you subtract 30, so 78 and divide it in half, 35, so it's close. Okay, so yeah, so yeah, yeah. So 300 Kelvin, 37 Celsius, and 100 Fahrenheit. 100 Fahrenheit sounds a lot hotter than those other two. <laughs> Is that right? 300? 310. Okay, yeah, I was thinking something wasn't right. Because it was only two degrees more than uh, room temperature. 310, thank you. All right. So, next time we'll do some more uh, unit conversions. We'll get into gas stoichiometry a little bit. I'll teach you a new way to approach stoichiometric problems. Once again, a way to think through them that you can. Uh, that will grow with you, okay, especially through this course. And uh, I'll see you then. Take care.